Good morning. Are you hungry? Because what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes might make you hungry. That is, if you like beef. Last week we took one beef to the butcher, a steer, and he dressed 370 pounds, which is about middle of the road for what we see come back from our Dexters. They're a small breed. And this represents all that came back from that steer. When you take a steer to the butcher and you get their dress weight, their dress weight is after they've been slaughtered and they're hanging on the hook, the whole carcass. So, of course, it's less than the live animal, and I forget the exact percentage. 70%, uh, something like that, 60 to 70% live weight versus hanging weight. You can look it up. It, it escapes me. Anyway, if it hangs at 370 pounds, you're going to get a percentage of that back because some of it gets cut out as bones and other things. So I think I worked it through in an earlier video like a year ago, and um, I think it works out to 70% or so of that that we get back. 70, 75% is in this box. So... I don't know what 70 75 percent of 370 is let's say it's it must be around 300 pounds or so that's what's in here and i'll show you what we get back these three boxes are all full of ground beef ground beef's got to be about half or maybe a little less than half of what we got back all packed in one pound packs we'll just put them in the freezer ground beef to me is like the staple meat sells year-round you know I barbecue making pasta sauce putting in chili it it's why we have so much made and I'll talk about the choices here in a second we don't have to have this much made when you have a beef cut up you got all kinds of choices and it took us a while to figure out what sold and what didn't sell at our market so how much ground beef we have made is a product of the roast that just don't sell very well. They're not fashionable. People don't want big roasts, whatever the reason is. And we have the top round roast, the bottom round roast, the eye round roast, the rump roast, the arm roast, and the Boston roast all made into ground beef. And that's not including all the trimmings that would normally be made into ground beef by the butcher. And of course, what you choose to have cut has profitability implications. We sell ground beef for $6 a pound. The roasts that we do sell, chuck roast, we sell for seven bucks a pound. I'd probably be charging that for all those roasts that we have made into ground beef if I could sell them. So you always have an eye toward the cost per pound of each pot and what you can sell. So after getting rid of the ground beef, I got four boxes left and one of them is more ground beef. So I really have three boxes after that. I've got suet that the butcher trimmed off, which we barter with soap makers. Also in here, I've got some specialty steaks, beef tri-tips, they're really fashionable. These tri-tip steaks, and we get um, only two per animal, are made off of the sirloin tip roast. They sell really well. The sirloin tip roast does not sell really well. So what remains gets ground into ground beef. Next in this box of miscellaneous cuts, we've got what the butcher calls a hanging tender, which is a hanger steak. And also known as the butcher steak. There's only one per animal. This is actually an inside the body cavity steak and there's just one. And this is how you get. This is highly prized by people who know their beef. We get two flank steaks, which are a long grain steak. And we get about 10 pounds of stew meat, which is just trimmings that the butcher takes off cubed up for stew. Just 10 pounds in an animal. And also in this box is some of the organ meat, heart, kidneys, tongue, those things sell well to the right people. Stick that box in the freezer. Now I'm down to three boxes out of my original seven. And the first box here has what I would call a little more miscellaneous. It's got more packages of stew meat. It's got sirloin steaks. We have ours cut bone in because we don't really get a lot back if we have them deboned. So we get some with small bones like this. These are three quarter inch thick. And we get some like this that have larger bones in them. And we wind up selling these at a discount per pound because of the size of the bone. And then in this paper bag is the oxtail, the liver, 
and the rest of the organ meats. You may have guessed, but I'm kind of working my way up from what I would consider the bottom price per pound cuts up to the highest price. And we come to this next box, which has rib steaks on the top. We have the rib steaks made in three quarter inch thick two piece packs. So you've got rib steaks on the top, then you've got short ribs. The ribs run this way through. And you've seen me cook these, these are delicious. And then we've got a lot of chuck roasts under here. The one roast we've found that sells really well still. And that does it for that box. Now then, this is the Primo box. And remember, it's one box out of seven. In this box, we've got porterhouse steaks, which we sell for 15 a pound. Bone in, of course, two per pack, three quarter inch thick. And then we've got T-bone steaks, same deal, two per pack, three quarter inch thick. And in this box, we've got skirt steaks, two pieces per pack. Here's one of the primary decisions that you make when having a beef cut, bone in or boneless, and the name of the cuts change. So let me tell you where they are and what the difference is. This is a porterhouse steak, and this here is a piece of the spine and through here. On the big side is the regular loin. On the smaller side is the tenderloin, kind of the most prized piece of meat in the cow or the steer. Now, if I had this cut boneless, they would cut around this bone and make this into a New York strip steak. New York strip steak is just loin. And they would make this into filet mignon, beef tenderloin. Now, when we talk about these steaks, I'll demonstrate where on me they would be located as a frame of reference. The tenderloin runs inside the body cavity, kind of back in here, right against the spine, my spine and back. And then as the, as the tenderloin starts to get smaller, as you come up, then you run into the T-bone steaks. And the only difference between a T-bone, this is T-bone, and a porterhouse, hey, that one doesn't have a label on it. I guess I'm gonna have to eat that myself. The only, <laughs> the difference between T-bones and porterhouses is how wide the tenderloin side is. See how narrow it is on a T-bone? On a porterhouse, you've got a wider piece of loin, and there, or tenderloin, and there is a butcher's requirement for how wide that needs to be to make a porterhouse steak. I think it's, it's like an inch and a half or an inch and three quarters or something like that, or wider. It's a porterhouse steak. So we're moving up the cow from the hip, remember, up, and so we have first porterhouse, and then we have T-bones and both would be made into New York strip and filet mignon if you choose to go boneless. Now as you continue up the body toward the head, remember porterhouse, T-bone, the next thing you come to are rib steaks and you've run out of tenderloin at that point and the meat starts to get more marbled as you get different muscle groups combined instead of just loin and tenderloin. Sounds like there's some beef making noise out there. These rib steaks have boneless equivalents. There's a bone right here in a rib steak. If they're boneless, and sometimes if they're bone in too, they're also called ribeyes. Ribeyes is a, technically is a boneless rib steak, but we also call these ribeyes because our customers are familiar with that terminology from the grocery store. The older cut name for ribeye was Delmonico, and you would get Delmonicos out of these boneless. And as you continue up, once you reach a certain point, then you're into chuck, and there's a whole lot of chuck roast in a single animal. This is one of them. They tend to be pretty marbled, and if they're slow cooked, they're pot roast, right? Combined with vegetables made with pot roast, but they're also good for smoking and making burn ends and that sort of thing. That's why they remain popular as a roast. One of the big challenges really with growing pork and beef is balancing consumer demand with what you have available. There's bound to be some cuts that don't sell as well as others, but you got to sell them all sooner or later or you're going to be in the hole. I found that people want the steaks, the porterhouses, the T-bones, the rib steaks, but as you can see, it's one-seventh of what I got back from the butcher. And if I had to quantify them, I'll bet you I've got probably eight to ten packs of porterhouse steak here. They're two-piece packs and probably about the same in T-bones, maybe a little more on the T-bone side. These don't go very far. And remember, I've got six other boxes of meat to sell. And it's funny that the beef steaks sell really fast. So I'll sell these steaks I just got back probably in the next two farmer's markets. 
but they're a small percentage of the animal. In contrast with pork, the equivalent to these steaks would be pork chops, which run all the way through here, all the way down to the hip, and there's a lot of them in a pig. Those are a lot harder to sell. In fact, those are one of the last things that we sell out of with pork. The cut list for beef is long, and it's hard to make the decisions if you don't have a feel for what's gonna sell or what you like. I mean, people aren't used to taking whole beefs and telling the butcher cut it this way and cut it that way. A few cuts that I did forget, there's two briskets floating around in those boxes someplace. They're only three or four pounds a piece. And then uh, you have a choice of what to do with the shanks. And the shanks, all the shanks are, is the point on the leg when you get down where there's not enough meat to really cut it into a much of a roast down to the hoof. And so you get these marrow bones that are surrounded by quite a bit of meat. In the winter, they sell well as soup bones to put in a pot and cook till they fall apart. In the summer, they don't sell well at all. So we have those ground into ground beef. And finally, some FAQs about beef. Um, number one, what do you do with the hides? Can you get the hides back? I don't know. I've never checked with my butcher. I don't have a use for the hides. My understanding is they were, are worth some money, but I assume it comes out of my butcher bill, him assuming that he can get some money for the hide. The same with the skull, especially if it's got horns on it. I've seen that he strips the skulls down and there's a market for those too. There seems to be a market for everything in beef. Uh, and the other thing I didn't mention is the bare bones that the butcher takes out. I get those back in a bag, sawed up, and I sell those as broth bones, which people who have digestive issues seem to really favor. It makes really good bone broth, especially the marrow bones. And the other question, of course, that can be really scary for any producer that's taken their beef to a butcher or their pork, how do you know you're getting your own product back? Well. For me, it's a little bit easier because we sell, we raise such a small breed. I can tell by the size of the cuts. If you're raising straight grass-fed beef, you can tell by the color of the beef as well. That dark color that I showed, that's a sign of two-year-old grass-fed beef. So it's pretty simple for me. It's harder for you if you're taking Angus or Hereford or grain-finished beef to the butcher. And lastly, a little trivia question, which you may not be able to answer unless you're my age or older. Who was Clara Peller? She was the where's the beef lady from the Wendy's commercials back in the 70s and 80s. Next time she asks you where's the beef, tell her it's right here. The way we have our beef cut is a product of our customer demand. You know, we're selling in the city. People want smaller cuts. They don't want big roasts. If I were selling out in the country, I'm sure it would be different. So your results may vary. I hope this video is informative and I hope you have a great day and I'll see you next time.